it, it, the debate really turned on a, a discussion of my opening statement about, um, about individualism. And we didn't really dig in to my criticism of conservatism or my criticism of nationalism or my criticism of religion as, a, 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 as integrated into the state, which is uh, part of Yom Chazoni and part of the national conservative agenda. We, we never really dug into that. We never really spent a lot of time on that. And I think that's also true of the Lex Friedman interview. And to some extent, that's a shame. But to another extent, I'd much rather focus on defending individualism, uh, dealing with the challenges to individualism, knocking back uh, the, the, the questions about individualism, uh, than I would s slamming uh, conservatism, or a particular view of conservatism. Uh, so it was, uh, I thought in that sense, the debate uh, took on an, an interesting and, and quite positive turn in that it focused really on uh, individualism, and I think the confusion that so many people have about individualism and the, 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 the specific confusions that I think conservatives have about individualism. And some of this was new to me. Uh, it, it new to me when I was reading up on Yom Chazoni, when I was reading other conservatives. I just read a piece by David Brooks, which I think summarizes conservative thought, the history of conservatism quite well. And, and it's absolutely true, there are a variety of different branches of conservatism, interpretation of conservatism. Uh, if you believe, you know, if you read David Brooks now, he will tell you that there are no real conservatives in, in the Republican Party, and he, and he is very opposed to the national conservatives as well, uh, and very opposed to Trump as a conservative. He thinks Trump's, it's ridiculous that Trump is a conservative. But uh, I learned quite a bit about conservatives' attitudes, particularly towards reason. I mean, I, this is an interesting observation. I hope you guys find it interesting, but it was interesting to me. You know, I make a big deal about reason in my talks, and I make a big deal about reason when we do our chats here on the Iran Book Show. I mean, reason is a foundational concept in objectivism. You, you can't get any of the objectivism without, uh, without really a, uh, a link uh, without a link to reason. Reason is at the core, right? And yet, reason, like a concept like freedom, is not something that is well understood by people. It's not something that, for example, Yom Chazoni, or for that matter, uh, I think Burke, or, or uh, many of the conservatives actually understand. Reason to them does not mean the identification, the, the faculty that identifies and integrates the data provided to us by our senses. Reason to them is not something connected directly to reality. It's not something that uses empirical evidence as the basis for abstraction. To them, reason is a faculty to some extent at least, if not to a large extent, divorced from reality, divorced from empirical knowledge, divorced from facts. It is a faculty that kind of starts from axioms, from first principles, and then deduces everything. It doesn't have. It doesn't have a, uh, uh, you know, any kind of any kind of basis in reality for them, right? So conservatives are empiricists. They are skeptical of reason. They believe reason is primarily a, uh, a means of central planning, that reason is divorced from experience, that reason is divorced from reality, that reason, therefore, is floating. They call this rationalism, and, and we in objectivism call it rationalism as well. Rationalism is, is, is ideas divorced from facts. It's, it's using deduction and pseudo-logic, divorced from reality and facts. It's having floating abstractions, not linked, not connected to reality. 
an idea of reason connected to reality in the way Ayn Rand means it and in the way I take for granted when I talk about reason is not something that they even consider, that they know how to think about, unfortunately. To them, there are two things. There's empirical reality from which we kind of get a sense of the world, and they don't use reason in, in terms of how we get a sense of the world. We, 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 we learn from it somehow, and uh, you know that that learning gets uh, uh, institutionalized into our institutions, and that becomes tradition, and that becomes, and, and then if it doesn't work, we adjust, we, we, we fix, we get on the right path or what we think is the right path and we keep moving forward and we'll make mistakes and we keep adjusting. We keep adjusting as we go along based on past precedents and based on, on reality as it is right now. But there's no reasoning. There's no abstracting away principles. There's no abstracting away the truth and then aligning our behavior and aligning the, the, what we do on the truth. And yes, that truth could be fallible. Truth is fallible, but a mechanism, a, a means of learning from reality, they don't consider that reason. I, I'm not sure what they call it exactly. And that's important because it, it just emphasizes the, the, con the idea that as objectivists, as, as promoters of a radical set of ideas, as promoters of something truly new, different, it's really, really crucial for us to define our terms. Frank says it sounds Kantian. Yes, they basically completely accept the Kantian understanding of the concept of reason. Now, you could argue that that exists in Locke as well, that to some extent at least, not fully, Locke was a rationalist, at least in terms of his justifications for his epistemology, not necessarily in the way it was explained, but in terms of his justification for it, he was a rationalist. But suddenly, their conception of, of reason is a, uh, a, a Kantian uh, conception of reason. So for example, Yom Chazoni hates Kant. But while hating Kant and thinking Kant is the destroyer of Western civilization, and we agree on that, he nevertheless embraces Kant's view of reason. And so do, I think, all conservatives. And therefore, reason is out, because reason is just rationalistic, unrelated to empirical knowledge. And they, what they can't conceive of, or what is difficult for them to conceive of, and where their fault, their, 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 their error lies, is the, the unwillingness to accept this context, content of the objective, as Ayn Rand understands it. That is, as, sorry, as objective reality and then objectivity and then this, this objectivist concept of reason. And, and it's not just objectivist con concept of reason. This is science. This is how science is done, right? You observe reality. You observe certain phenomena in reality. You observe certain relationships in reality. You abstract from that an understanding of it. You integrate it into the rest of your knowledge and you come up with an understanding of it that then, in science, you would test. You would come up with a hypothesis in the scientific method and you would test that hypothesis. But you always start with experience. You always start with the facts. That is the identification part of reason. You identify what's going on. Then you integrate it, and that's the new knowledge. And then you test your integration against reality. You reduce it back to reality to see if it actually is true. And that kind of abstraction, which is what science does, which is what the scientific method's all about, which is what we see in action with science. They have no, I, they don't have a sense of it. They don't have a sense of it. And of course, part of it is that they're not 
scientists and they're intellectuals and they live in their own little bubble and they come up with intellectual arguments. But, um, and I think religion plays a bit in this, right? The role of revelation, the role of discovering truth that's divorced from experience. So, uh, Johan's an interesting religionist because he's an empiricist. So, it was interesting because it just reinforces the idea that we, as radicals, have to really, um, we really have to define our terms constantly. What do we mean by reason? You can't just take it because we all understand each other, take it that everybody else out there understands us as well. They don't. Most people have a Kantian understanding of reason. And they think that if you're mentioning reason, you're talking about some deduction from original, I don't know, some kind of arbitrary axioms. None of that is indeed true. New knowledge, almost all new knowledge, is inductive. And this is not me saying, or not all new knowledge is inductive. It's not me saying, this is Ayn Rand, Leonard Peacock, this is objectivism. So that was, I, I, I thought, interesting in preparing for the debate, the extent to which that is true, to the extent to which they are anti-reason, because they have a wrong conception of reason, and indeed the right conception of reason is beyond them. They, they, they can't comprehend it. And indeed, most philosophers can't comprehend it. Um, anyway, so I thought uh, the debate... Uh, was a good debate. It was a debate I think people could learn from. It was a debate that, you know, I think Yom focused on objections to individualism rather than positive presentation of the virtue of, of, of conservatism. Um, and that gave me an opportunity to rebut them. I, I also thought that the questions brought out a lot of that. So there were a lot of good questions. And generally, the audience was particularly intellectual. Uh, I'd say most of the audience were objectivists, but there were a number of students there who asked questions, and the questions were good, and they were not just, uh, they were good questions, and they were not gotcha questions, which is always a danger with an objectivist audience. They were good, thoughtful questions that, that got, uh, you know, got us talking about important things. Uh, okay, let's look at some of these super chat. Robert says, excellent debate, as always, the question for which they, socialist nationalists alike, have no answer is why. Why should one act for the sake of something, anything, which is no personal value significance? Yes, and, and that's the sense in which he never made a positive case for, uh, for, for, for conservatism. Now, I, I asked that why. I asked the why in terms of, uh, you know, my objective, objection to his collectivism. And I asked it in my opening statement, and he never really answered because there never really is an answer. And, uh, but that is, that is the key, and that's why... I think there's so much more content on the side of individualism to talk about, including to attack. So uh, I think much of the conversation, both in the debate and, and at the, at the um, Friedman uh, interview, was, was very much on the, focused on the individualism. But again, I am interested, curious about your responses uh, to the debate uh, and, and what you thought we, uh, that was covered and whether you have any questions coming out of it any comments, any suggestions, any criticisms. Uh, so please use the Super Chat uh, to do all that. Uh, we're at about $170 so far. Okay, Michael asks, with $50, thank you, Michael. Uh, Johan mentioned he was caring for a mentally ill parent and gets no selfish benefit from it, however, but he is doing it out of tradition. Why don't you address this during the debate? How would you handle such a situation in your own life? I, if I remember right, that was during the Q and A. You can't address everything, and and it's it's really I mean that is a it's a complicated issue. Um, uh, you have to attribute uh, motivation to him, um, and uh, so so it's complicated and uh, it's it's difficult to do when you're asked to only respond to questions with two minutes, uh, which is what we were asked to uh, uh, only have two minutes. So I. I there were other things that I thought were more important uh, relevant to that. But uh, here's what I would have said. I would have said uh, two things. If it's truly you're doing it only out of a sense of duty and out of a sense of tradition, then I think it is a sacrifice. And it's not good. You shouldn't be doing it. Why are you doing it? Right? Where's, the, where's the positive answer to why? Tradition is not an answer. 
tradition, or, or tradition is an answer, but it's an irrational answer. It's not, if you don't have a self-interested reason to do it, if you don't have a rational reason to do it, if you're doing it just because that's what people do, that's what's expected of me, and now you're complete second-handed, or this is the tradition that's complete second-handed, I, I expect you at least to have some explanation, but that's the problem with collectivism, tradition, altruism, is they don't have an answer to the why. They don't answer, have an answer to why do you do it? What's the reason? And they certainly don't have a reason to answer, partially because they don't believe in reason as important. How would I handle the situation? Well, it depends. And, and that's the thing that happens when you have a rational morality. It depends is obvious. Everything is contextual. Everything depends on the circumstances, the relationship, what's going on. For example, how close is this relative to me? Or in this case, parent. But, but let's say it's a relative. I think he said relative, not parent. How close is the relative to me? Close, distant. I see him all the time, never see him at all. So what is the relationship? How important is this person to me? It's a parent I kind of like, but I never see and, and don't care that much for. It's a parent I love, respect, admire, who had a crucial part in, 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 in raising me and, and, and helping me become the person I become. My relationship with that person is completely different depending on, on that answer. So, who is the person? What's my relationship to it? Is, defines how I would deal with that situation. A remote relative, or even a close relative, that is remote in a sense that I didn't have a relationship, don't have a relationship with, obviously, I wouldn't care for. I, I mean, I'd consider providing some funding with other family members to, to provide support to them if I had some positive relationship with them. But if I had no positive relationship with them, I wouldn't even do that. If it was my wife, my child, a parent that I love deeply, then of course I would do it. Not out of a sense of tradition, or out of a sense of duty, but out of a sense of love. This person is dear to me. They are struggling. They're having a hard time. They need help, even though it's hard, even though it's painful. They're part of me. You can't separate the people I love, in that sense, from me. So, of course I would take care of them. Of course I would help them out. Of course it would be difficult. But it is part of what it means to have a deep relationship with somebody. It's part of what it means to love. Part of that is to take care of somebody. You know, particularly as we grow older, this becomes evident. You know, as we grow older, things are going to be rough. You don't just walk away from somebody you love because things are rough. You don't walk away from somebody you love because they're hurting, they're struggling. On the contrary, what, what then does your love mean? It's the same as a, a question somebody asked me actually in Denver, in my talk in Denver. Well, what about soldiers who fight in a war? Aren't they being selfless? No. If, if your values are sometimes going to require you to do difficult things, your values are sometimes going to require you to risk your life. Your values are sometimes going to require you to spend a lot of money. So, for example, for a soldier, your values are sometimes going to require you to go to war because your value of freedom, the value of living on your own terms, the value of being of providing 
for your family and for the people that you love and, and, and making sure that they live under freedom, that sometimes will require you to risk your life. It certainly required the founding fathers to risk their lives. Not to risk your life for it, not to fight for it, is indeed a betrayal of yourself, a betrayal of your values. And this is what people get wrong about individualism. This is what people get wrong about the whole idea of individualism. Individualism doesn't mean living on a desert island. Individualism doesn't mean not caring about anybody else. Individualism and the pursuit of happiness doesn't mean short-termism. It means identifying the values that will make you happy and fighting for those. And sometimes you will fight for them and not win. And it means that if a person, another person, a friend, a lover, is in deep trouble, or is deeply hurting, or is mental problems or, or physical problems, then one cares for them because they are of value to you. And it's your loyalty to your own values that you do it. This is why it's selfish to do it, because it's your loyalty to your own values. And that's what people don't get about being selfish. Being selfish is not about going by emotion. Being selfish is not about being short term. Being selfish is not about, is not about some superficial, I want to have my ice cream now. Being selfish means deciding on a, a choosing, evaluating constantly, reaffirming a hierarchy of values. And then fighting for those values. Now, not an arbitrary hierarchy of values, not a hierarchy of values based on tradition, not a hierarchy of values based on what other people think, a hierarchy of values that you have discovered, that you have chosen as yours because these are the principles that you believe will lead to your happiness, consistent with your morality, consistent with your philosophy. And you don't just willy-nilly dump a bunch of them just because, whoops, it's going to take a lot of work. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brook Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbrookshow.com support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one of those uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content, and of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.